Hello and welcome to Grace St. Luke's Episcopal Church in Memphis, Tennessee. My name is Ali Rencher and today, uh, October the 25th, we welcome Jarrett Bingham of Dragonfly as a part of our adult formation offerings. Uh, here at Grace St. Luke's, we're continuing to learn a lot about the community, um, the community of Memphis, ways to engage, ways to stretch ourselves, outreach, social justice, partnerships, and have been impressed with the work of Dragonfly and some of its most recent work of the Hub Hotel, about which we'll hear more. But I'm glad that um, my brother and friend Jared is able to be with us today. And so with that, I'd like for Jared to introduce himself and share a bit about his story and how he's come into this work, and we'll have a conversation on this day. But again, welcome to Grace St. Luke's and Adult Formation. Jared. Thanks, Ollie. Thanks, all of you. So I, was, I came up in East Tennessee in, a, in a, the big city of Harriman outside of rural Morgan County where all my people lived. The roads were dirt, terminal geographies up in there. And there wasn't really much of a, an economic base. Uh, oftentimes the young men would graduate from high school and then go off in search of work to Georgia or Ohio and then come back in the summertime to visit their family. But the economy was mostly a subsistence agricultural economy for um, people living on, on pensions from military service. And, uh, and in that kind of uh, magical rural childhood bubble, um, the realities of poverty were so different um, as an experience of a kid as they are here in Memphis or in big urban centers, you didn't feel the poverty as an oppressive thing. You felt it as an opportunity for leisure. You know, in some ways, you, you experience this if you travel like to the Caribbean or, or in the old days, New Orleans. There was poverty, but play. You know, and lightness too. Right. That's the, the everybody played music where I came from. We we sang uh, shape note hymns at the in church would go forever. You know, you still play but, um, and sing. Yeah, yeah. And my, I've got three kids, and they're they're all uh, cutting their teeth at, at various Amazing. things, you know, music. It's, it's, uh, it's lovely. My daughter was with my mother in East Tennessee and went to visit her second cousin who has horses. And, uh, and her father had been a fantastic guitar picker, guitar picker, as we mm -hmm. would say. And so there was that musical thing flowing down. They just got back last week. But, but you people, Flannery O'Connor writes about the Christ haunted South. It was certainly true in my upbringing that there was, it was, you were either in the church or serving the devil. There was no other thing, no other way of being a person, you know, and, uh, and I wanted to be serving the church clearly. So, uh, so as I came of age and, and was allowed to study in university, I, I, Felt myself drawn towards uh, trying to figure out the stories of our patriarchs and the origins of our our sacred faith story, and recognize the power that that has to affect change within a dominant hegemonic tradition like American Christianity. Right. And um, and followed that call and the advice of of counselors to well, I followed Ellen to Memphis, but I followed the call into the pulpit. I was Baptist and I was super progressive. And so there were really very few opportunities for me in those days, but the Presbyterians took me in and eventually I had a, a blessed opportunity to serve the people at Shady Grove Presbyterian in East Memphis um, for a good number of years. And How long I loved Memphis? that. How long were, have you been in Memphis roughly? I came in 2000. Okay. okay. And uh, so it's, it's very, there's a lot of class in my background. The, the way I was, I wasn't really raised with professional, with people who had like jobs and vacation time. And so um, and my, my parents worked, but they worked for themselves. And, and so Ellen, as a Presbyterian clergy person, got six weeks vacation, well, four weeks vacation and two weeks study leave. We were to be married. And I, it, it was inconceivable to me that anybody would hire me and give me six weeks vacation off to go and be married with my wife. We went to Geneva to John Calvin's church for our honeymoon. Wow. Um, so I signed on as a carpenter. I worked as a carpenter for a couple of years, and okay. knowing that I could just no, not come to work and it'd be okay. They'd do their work and the next, right. I'd get back in town. But eventually found myself to a, a parish ministry. And in that ministry, I, I felt one of my greatest obligations was to protect the knit fabric of the community and to serve God's will amongst those people 
uh, even if it were at odds with my own particular vision of call. Okay. And so, and there's a, way, a role of the prophetic in my work, but that prophetic work was always in tension with the communal call. And so things like Just City, when it came about, I was there, I loved Just City. I supported it and, you know, stood up for it. And we hosted some Just City stuff in the early yes. days at Shady Grove. But, but we didn't really own Just City as a congregation because the congregation didn't have a will to own Just City as a congregation. Now they might have with the right kind of formation and the right kind of committee leadership, but it's not a top down decision. That's a, a mutual decision. Right. Individually, so, yes. Collectively, more challenging. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And, and, and you know, things like there's a, there was a study that came out. I remember with, with the, if the kids learn the first, maybe 200 words, maybe 300 words by second grade then their chances of success are exponentially higher. Right. And so it seems like a no brainer. If you're a congregation, like everybody go to their kids and teach them two or 300 words, but it was like a scheduling disaster to get our 300 people to actually, you know, do that thing. Right. right. So, right. So when I felt called away from Shady Grove, um, the initial freedom, one of the initial freedoms that I felt was, man, I can get involved in whatever I want. If I want to go support youth basketball in South Memphis, I can lend myself body and soul to that thing yes. because it's just me following, not me responsible for leading from behind a whole group of people. Understood. So, yeah. So with Boundless Energy, I got into, it was 13 different um, nonprofits that I was giving time to and by that november i left shortly after easter by that november i had completely burned out and so i was laying on the floor in the living room thinking man i am tired and don't have any any optimism for anything i'm doing and i realized that i'd i'd overextended myself so i made a list of all 13 and the, the people who the organizations that were doing more where i was doing more than they were for their own cause all this was pro bono um, I. I politely cut them loose. And, and at the end of the day, there were only three things. <laughs> and one of those was the hospitality hub. And two okay. of them were things that, that I had started. So at that, that and the really hospitality began, hub, that's remind me that's located in downtown Memphis. Sure. Right. It, it was forever. It was a Calvary's campus on Calvary's campus at 82 North second. Um, just this week, the hub is fully transitioning to a plaza, plant at 590 Washington in preparation for 82 North 2nd to become a room in the end campus for Episcopal congregations. Oh, how um, beautiful. It's really beautiful. It's beautiful. It's really beautiful. Right. Oh, yeah. That's a major, major change um, for the community and for the spirit and for people who have wondered about how do we, um, care for and and show compassion you know for the least of these right and and to see it happening yeah. in this way um i had have um volunteered before in those spaces and i'm glad to know the the nature of what's taken place as of today this very day um, what is it's dragonfly really dragonfly is your firm dragonfly right collective what is its role in the hospitality hub and what we have heard about the hub hotel. Um, sure. Talk about that um, for us, please. Right. So, um, what Dragonfly Dragonfly offers strategic development to ideas that are that are um, on the fringe of of the things that the mainstream economy tries to accomplish, and okay. we, we we like to spend time working to make access to the idea of a, of a mainstream participation in the fullness of life to, full, to groups and, and places where that's not, that access has not been granted. So the, the hub, long, when Andy was at Calvary um, and they were trying to figure out how to, how to serve homeless people, they, they reimagined a drop-in center and June Averett at the time and Ellen drafted that version on our counter and then Andy championed it and the downtown churches supported building the hub early in the day. And so through the years we tried to help it, but we, it was sort of hand to mouth. Um, Calvary carried payroll for a while and then, you know, we'd be super, the hub would be super broke. And so we'd have to call like a donor, Hey Ollie, can you give me $10,000 for payroll? So, um, 
I knew it needed to change. And I, I got involved in trying to build out a, a system of support for the hub that would help the power brokers downtown recognize that it's to their advantage that homeless people are taken care of. It could have as easily made the case to all the churches in the community. It's to our advantage that the least of these are taken care of. Um, and probably could have made a case to all the individual citizens that is to the, the householder's advantage that homeless people are taken care of. But we chose to go with political and development power brokers. And that, that long work of development paid off very well. So now the hub has a stable and balanced portfolio of funding. It, it can always use more funding, but, okay. um, but it's no longer running backwards on payroll and having to call Ollie and Ellie and beg for $10,000 to right. make this month. Right. Payroll, you know. So, so Dra Dragonfly pays attention to those, observes the problem sets and tries to strategically align the sorts of support that'll allow a, a novel approach to solving a complicated social problem to have some traction. Okay. We have about six people, um, sometimes eight, no fewer than five who go to work on, on those things every day, all day long. And, and it's, it's super meaningful. How long has it been together, the, the group in its official capacity um, as Dragonfly Collective? Uh, I spent some we, time we, on the website and it was just nice to learn more about it and, and Memphians and people from around the country and beyond who are watching this um, um, will be um, impressed as I've been just with the sorts of things you're up to. Um, but how long? It's, it's as, a, as an idea that we were, that a legal entity probably three years, as a place with a storefront and real desk with computer monitors and chairs and alarm codes and that sort of thing, we're just under two years. Okay. So the think board behind you is an example? Oh. Is that a think board? Yeah, this, um. is, um, this is the sketch for the, the HUB CARES Act request and operational build out. We, when we built the hotel, which I can talk in detail about if you like. I'd um, like, yeah, I'd definitely like to hear about it because the first of its kind. It is. Um, but anyway, you're we, bored. Actually, well, bored. we built the hotel and, and we, were, we were really playing instincts. Okay. Um, it was fast and there was a crisis, a, a pandemic that, was, that had a lot of people scared and maybe would be taking people's lives. And so we were responding at a moment of crisis, but as we stabilized that initial, um, that we got through that first month or so, we had a chance to reflect on how is this gonna interact with the long ongoing plans for the hospitality hub and the women's shelter build? How does it interact with our uh, aspirations for doing the, the best version of comprehensive street level outreach that the world has ever known in Memphis? And so that what you're seeing there is how those things tie together, at least the first draft form before it made it into a right. HR manual, you know? Yeah, um, so tell us the about the hub hotel. Yeah, the hub hotel. I. I was um, fascinated to learn about it and its um, novelty, I would say, yeah. for the community and just to educate us on that because um, many may be aware, but I think many more aren't aware. When, when um, the way I remember it is the NBA shut down and then COVID became real like in 24 hours to everybody that I knew. And, and SCS offered this one week early spring break thing, you know, y'all go home now and maybe come back after spring break. It was supposed to be 14 days or so. But at that time, Room in the Inn closed down. The mayor was about to register safer at home orders. And so our executive director at the hub called me and said, hey, um, Room in the Inn's closing down. We're going to have 24 women on the streets tonight unless we do something about it. So we went down and, and, uh, uh, it was just because we were we were just naive clergy together 20 years ago. You know, we were just we were the we were the kind of Protestant Catholic worker kids coming out of divinity school, and now we're 45. But that moment right. brought all that back alive in us, and we said, "Well, we can't. We have to open a place of hospitality today." So, so we called First Pres. Servant or ministry. Right. Yeah, just it was the just the truest sense of servant ministry. The Spirit is at work, and we must act. All my kids, um, Star Wars twin sheets, which when I was a kid, I had Star Wars twin sheets. I mean, right. they're not that significant, but you know, there's some things. Right. They all yeah. went to move it to shelter, to build the shelter, that first pop-up shelter night at First Pres. 
we called the mayor's office to make sure we wouldn't get in trouble as a we didn't want to be counter messaging what they were saying they were okay. saying no congregant go home and we were saying right. we're about to put 23 people in a in a fellowship hall is that cool with you you know um but pretty quick pretty quickly on the heels of that we realized that for a pandemic response having a pop-up shelter in a a food hall uh, a parish hall and then having the women leave and come back was going to be a huge health risk so we we walked to every hotel in the core okay. asking if we could buy out a floor for these homeless women wow and we had um we had wow. two two of 13 after everyone was interested not everyone most people were interested but you have to talk to the owner in dallas and all the things have to line up and two said yes okay. the marriott group that that is downtown was um, one of our chief supporters. And so we petitioned HCD to help build a voucher program just for the women there. Okay. And that just was, for the women. Wow. So we moved mm -hmm. all the homeless women in Memphis into a boutique hotel in Memphis to weather the, in downtown Memphis to weather the pandemic. It was super beautiful. Ollie. I'm sure. It was like something out of the Beatitudes. Right. Yes. And the truest you know, sense you know, of, of beauty really. and pride and, and esteem that has oh. been met. Um, well, well y'all at Grace St. Luke, that long ago, one cold, cold night, Ellen and Jean went out uh, to try to convince women to come in. And that, that first night, Mutella, you may, may or may, I'm sure your people I've Mutella. heard this story, yes. yes. She came in and sat on a bench in your hallway and she, yes. she couldn't make eye contact, she couldn't lay down, she just sat. It, so, but then eventually, in the graciousness mm. of hospitality and the trust of a stable place to be, she, she became, Fourteen times more, more able to be in touch with her humanity, and so we saw this at the at the downtown boutique. There's like right. no no eye contact, you know, a, a almost paranoid sense of of maybe losing my few belongings to this this opening and the and smiles and the ability to talk and right. ask for things. It and was beauty. just super beautiful. Mm -hmm. So so much. Um, so how do but people it was serve through, there? How do people see it and experience it and help? Well, well, that's su super interesting. So we we did all that. We we didn't talk about it publicly at all mm -hmm. because the we wanted this. We don't want to be in trouble with the city. We don't have a weird relationship with the city, but you know, all, it's a, there were so many minefields, like you could have put all the homeless women in a hotel and had 24 homeless COVID cases and it could have been a real eyesore for the administration. And That's so true. like you guys handle, whenever you want to talk about it, talk about it. We'll be super discreet and super quiet. Um, and then in time, the political will, not just with city hall, but also in the country evaporated around, remember around the 4th of July, people are having picnics and COVID yeah. wasn't really real anymore and all that. So about the same time that that was happening, this $40 a night hotel voucher project um, lost its support. Right. And so, so we knew that was coming and we were looking for some way to transition that program into something that would be stable for the pandemic. Because we, you know, for, if you're planning a pandemic, you know the virus isn't, doesn't care about whether you get tired. It's right. just gonna keep on being a virus. So we found a, a rooming house through some connections um, with Mid South Sober Living, and we we had we threw contractors at it really quickly. We found some philanthropy to help uh, pay for the purchase of the building really quickly. We had some city council support to pay eventually for the renovations of the building to put in COVID compliant air handlers and COVID compliant all the everything else's. And then we moved the women from the pop up um, hotel project into what we call the hub hotel. Okay. And so it's I now a permanent fixture in the city. Right. Oh, it's, it's, it's really great. It right. ties, it carries for the people who are with us in those, those four months downtown when it was, yes. it was 24 yes. seven. Our neighbors were, you know, holding up at home, wondering what to do. And we're like, yeah, I wish I could hold up. <laughs> right. To do. That's right. That's right. So it has a nod to the, to that hotel, the, the boutique. It has a nod to that and the logo and, it's very trauma informed. We brought in a trauma informed consultant designer and, right. and lighting and, and we've we've spaces. just learned, we've learned so much. Oh, yeah. the color palette. We, mm -hmm. The hub logo is red. Red is a terrible trauma informed color. I had no idea. Yes, it's it's cool mm -hmm. tones. Mm -hmm. So the whole thing is pastel blue. It has beautiful greens throughout. So it's a it's a, it's a super healing place. Mm. Now the 
it, it also highlights- And who's its director it. now? So in the org chart, it's, it's underneath the, the overarching directorship of Kelsey Johnson, who runs the hub. But uh, we have three Kelseys, and we actually have a job applica uh, an application for a fourth Kelsey Johnson at the hub. It's crazy. Okay. So, so there's a second Kelsey Johnson, right. who's the director of the hub hotel. I'm losing your Shelby. face. Bring your face I'm back sorry. over. There you are. Keep going. So, so there's a, a director of the hotel who's sort of the the heart and soul of it, the concierge of the place. Yes. And then there's a director of client pathways at the hotel who's in okay. charge of making sure that the team works to place the women into a sustainable position later. Okay. That's a gap. And we're okay. working at Dragonfly to, to fill that. Right. The next step before independent housing, our people get out, they'll get their first place, and then they'll get lonely. Oh. Or the little road bumps that you hit. Right. You know. I know to call people when I get in trouble, but yes. if you've been told no your whole life, you, your first instinct isn't to call back to the hotel and say, hey guys, I'm having trouble, can you help me? There's a sense of shame there. So right. our next plan is to build um, both an operations model where people can go and check on folks once they've, been, once they've made it into stable housing and also some stable housing um, infrastructure that has a, a sense of shared community around the same life experience. Okay, and am I correct uh, or, or explain for me the unique situation of this being a first of its sort for women. There have been many places where men have been able to go and stay and be safe and warm and, and be in transition, as it were, as I understand it. But will you kind of unpack that some of the, what makes this sure. um, um, novel? Sure. Well, so in this community in our community there are places that there are programs where women can go to, to be supported in their transition out of homelessness right um, we don't have the, an adequate number of beds for the number of women who are homeless in our community and we don't have any what we call barrier free programs we have a, a few shelters that are run that are barrier free meaning just show up and come in right, right. Um, the hub hotel with 27 bed capacity bridges the gap between the programs at the sisters and the programs at the Salvation Army. And there's a shelter called Living for Christ that will take single women, but we really don't like to send single women there. We, we prefer to have a, a different kind of thing. Um, but so the hub hotel is barrier free and has bridge the gap of capacity and then it is COVID compliant so okay. each room has an individual air handler that's the most expensive part of the compliance and right. then it's purely sanitized all the time okay um, and are children allowed to be with their with is that in their current I, overall I, arrangement or is that a part of, of figuring it out it is a part of figuring it out one of the things that i love about the hub is that they uh, they're so people first. They don't. Mm -hmm. They don't ever have a policy that a human being in their situation can't break. You know, and so the Hub Hotel is a great example of that. When we moved from the downtown boutique to the Hub Hotel, we made a policy that nobody could come in for 14 days because we wanted to stabilize the quarantine. Yes. You know? And then within an hour, the first petition from a staff person was like, "Hey, you got to let." Emily in. And then the second hour, a second. By the end of the day, we had three women who weren't supposed to be at the hub hotel in the hub hotel. And since then, it's been like, if you have need, come. But now, you have to quarantine yeah. until you get a negative test there. Um, and we've had four babies born since quarantine. Okay. So even though we're, we, we never planned to be a family place, you, Just we, we have moms with babies. That's right. Um, but at, but Officially in our community, the continuum of care supports homeless families through MIFA. And so as a partner in the continuum of care, we do that as well. We, okay. we want all the people who are qualified for family support through MIFA to go through MIFA. And we want to resource those families and resource MIFA to be able to do their work. Okay. Okay. That, that's helpful to hear because we have, um, as is the case of most um, houses of worship around the city, um, people who come seeking assistance and we try and do the best we can to connect them with resources 
and we do a lot of that, for instance, with MIFA because they can um, track and help and assist and connect. And it's good to know that you are an example or the hospitality hub or hub, hub hotel is another extension of the kind of work um, that's happening in partnership with places like MIFA and many other places that refer. Um, that's just helpful because I know that's right. something that we here at Grace St. Luke's are learning more and more about how is it that we can be as engaged in the community as possible and how um, parishioners can be a part of that and how we can work with agencies and um, others who are committed to this work. And that's why what Dragonfly is supporting uh, and encouraging um, kind of the incubation as it were, <laughs> um, it is, it is for me of the spirit. It is the spirit at work in that, in that boundless way. Um, and so I'm, I'm very energized um, by what you're describing and what, what you're up to. And, and what I'd be curious, what advice do you, um, as someone who has served in the church and served in faith communities, and you're now, as it were, out there um, crossing all lines, um, all, as I use the term, all sorts and conditions. What advice would you give to those who are listening today about community engagement and the um, importance of that? And I would even say the discipleship um, that comes with that as people are listening to us today in our dialogue. Yeah, I would. Yeah, the one of the, I think that a helpful framework for me has been, um, in 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 church terms, we used to talk about abundance and scarcity, and uh, those were all too real at budget budget season. Sometimes it looked like it was ex going to be extremely scarce, and you wanted to talk about an abundant God and abundant ministry. Right. right. But but um, but a, a great number of our nonprofits live in with a fear of scarcity or or on the cusp of scarcity. There. And that's not a very, a very right place for innovation. Now it can be. It can drive. You're up against the wall. You have to do something new. Right. But, but all too often, it, there's there's just a sort of cycle of mediocrity that okay. we'll we'll do what we did do, and then we'll get enough money to do what we did do, and we'll try to get enough money to do what we did do. And if you've served on boards, then you know this thing. That's just like, I think we started talking about that seven years ago, and we're still talking about it. You know. Right. Um, hmm. so at, at Dragonfly, we have a, a, a loose operations model that says observe a problem, build a model that addresses the problem, create a pilot that can test the model in the real world. And then if you can tweak the pilot and it works, then find the support to make it scale, right? It's a pretty right. quick, pretty linear progression to, right. to excellence compared to a, a nonprofit that's been doing the same thing for nine years about the same way, never thinking about how to do the next thing because they're still trying to figure out how to do the thing they're supposed to be doing. Um, the support that we as, as not on the ground operators, but as people with social capital and direct capital for helping, I think that it's well funneled into creating a plateau of abundance okay. from which innovation can come. The hub could never have built the hub hotel while it was trying to manage the pop-up crisis response to COVID for 304 homeless people in the city core. Right. We could build it because we could take a step back and say, we got you covered operationally. We're going to build this new thing. And then you can go bring the operations to this new thing and be supportive. Then you can thrive because we've created a, an abundant platform. Right. You know? Okay. Okay. Well, that's so, just helpful to think in those terms of, of, I keep doing this is where, you know, when the spirit, moves um mm -hmm. and it it can go anywhere i mean it can take you anywhere and so living in that freedom um that yeah. that comes with um being in the space you're in now um is helping you and helping others to thrive you're being rewarded by the work you do fed by the work you do and you're feeding others um by the work you do uh and i i commend that i just am grateful you know, for what you're up to and, and to learn more Thanks. today about Dragonfly and about the Hub Hotel. And, and for those who are listening to us today, maybe they will glean something from this. And I suspect even if they're not doing it while we're speaking, 
um, will quickly be all over the internet learning more about um, your firm what you do and then what the community is experiencing through the goodness um, that is your work and so I want to express my gratitude um, that you're willing to have a conversation with me today about this and to um, be a part of our adult formation here at Grace St. Luke's because we're committed to growth, spiritual growth, um, engagement, and helping people find ways to connect um, with one another and to go beyond themselves which ultimately we're called to do as human beings, but um, we normally need companionship and ministry sure. and, and, and agencies like yours who are helping people get there. So, yeah. No, thanks, Ollie. It's great to connect with you. And yeah. anybody, to, to send, send my contact, drive people to the hub if they like. There's, there's a lot of exciting work coming in the future and plenty of ways to get involved. Well, I know we'll be in touch more and I'll, add information about um about your firm but about the hospitality hub through our outreach page our social justice page on our website and some other connections and our associate rector the reverend laura Geddes, um is working very closely with our outreach and social justice laypersons and their teams as we go deeper uh, as a parish and so uh, again, just to say thank you, um, and to all of you who've joined us today, thank you to Jarrett Bingham of Dragonfly and for the work of the Hub Hotel that is one of the examples of the community impact being made by them. I hope you'll tune in to us uh, as often as possible and just know that you're loved by God as an image of God, um, wherever you are and whoever you are, and hope to be in touch. Peace. Peace.